Welcome to uh, the panel session. I hope you uh, had uh, a nice morning tea break. Um, this is uh, D. Teal, AKA the Web Princess, um, a project manager at uh, Human Made, and she is going to be um, emceeing slash moderating uh, the panel. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to her to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, can you hear me? Is my coming through? Yep. Awesome, great. To my right and your left, this is Luke Carvis. He's the product manager, head of product at XWP, WordPress uh, development agency. Next to him is Rob. He works for Automatic. He's a design, uh, developer, a JavaScript developer, so he can answer your really gnarly technical questions, so we'll hand all of those to him. Um, and Kath is a, de a designer who's um, actually going to do a talk about design um, after this but she can answer some questions around. Have you done your talk? You haven't done your talk yet? No. You haven't done your talk yet? Yeah, yeah. so she's going to answer some questions around that, so she can answer design um, questions. I will do my best. Um, the mic is, it is on. Okay, cool. I'll, 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 awesome. And I'll stop turning my head away from the microphone and turn all of me instead of just my head. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, just to get us started, I've got a couple of questions that we prepared earlier. Um, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So let me just pull those questions up. Ah, here, right. So there was quite a lot, obviously quite a lot of conversation after Luke's talk yesterday. So I'm hoping that some of these questions will have already been answered. So I'm going to answer some of the slightly gnarlier questions. Um, uh, ask them. Some, I'm, I'm not answering questions, I'm just uh, driving. So, my developer agency web person says they've never heard of it. What do I need to tell them? <laughs> Is there anybody in the room who's actually never heard of Gutenberg, who wasn't here first thing yesterday morning and didn't actually hear us talking about it? Great. Let's start, Luke. Will you explain, seen as given the elevator pitch about Gutenberg? Sure. Uh, Gutenberg is an entirely refreshed approach to editing content on the web. Uh, it learns from the, the mistakes and also from some of the good things that other publishing platforms that exist in our ecosystem use to create a new tool uh, for editing content and it replaces the existing WordPress editor. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, what should you tell your clients? I think you should tell them that WordPress is getting an update and that the editor that you're used to is going to change and it's going to get way better and it's going to be much easier to use than it's ever been before. And if you just go ahead and add a new post or edit one of your old posts, you'll notice that it's really easy to use. If you do need any help, then give me a call and I'll be able to talk you through it. <laughs> that, that's what you should tell that's them. That's what you tell them. Cool. You guys want to so oh, here's great. a good one. I've half built my site. Do I have to start again? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I have a website. I've got a couple of them. I've built a few of them, um, like hundreds of them. <laughs> um, I turned Gutenberg on to my own site yesterday while we were doing the talk. It didn't break. Nothing broke. I have a page builder that I use to build the fancy pages on my website. It didn't break. It's still there. I don't think that you're going to have too much problem with backward compatibility. I think that you have to be mindful of the new blocks and the styling around those blocks and it's actually going to open opportunities for those of you who are theme designers um, to, or people who are getting new themes in the next year or two are going to be able to take advantage of the new little design components in the regular editor. But um, for those of you who are building a site or whose um, developers are building a site for them, um, just be mindful of it. I'd reckon just give it a crack, turn it on, see what happens. Um, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. How do they turn it on? Rob? No? Yeah, so right now if you install the Gutenberg plugin, uh, it will be on for all all of your posts. If you uh, install the plugin, or you know later if you upgrade to WordPress 5.0, which would have it included, um, new posts would be entirely Gutenberg, and existing posts you would open 
all of the post content would be in what we call the classic block. And there's an option to migrate that old post over into full on blocks. And you can What's have a block? Your way. A block is. Uh, Someone yesterday said there are like short codes 2.0. Like you can kind of think of them like that. Maybe <laughs> it's, uh, the block is the the unit of a post is going to consist of a series of blocks. The block is going to be the basic building block, if you will, for WordPress going forward. Luke might be able to explain it better. You're good at the <laughs> elevator pitches. Okay, so I have one more question here and then we'll open it up to the floor. What do I need to learn to develop a new Gutenberg block? JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> um, we've tried to make it as easy as possible, uh, but it is, you know, you're, you're going to need some JavaScript. Um, there's a lot of good resources right now. If you go to wordpress.org slash Gutenberg slash handbook, um, there's all sorts of documentation, including how to extend Gutenberg and how to build your own block type. Awesome. There's also a few talks if you go to wordpress.tv that are yeah, super helpful. Yeah, that's a really good place to start too. Right, so that pretty much answers all of the questions that I had already organised. How many of you have come with questions of your own and who would like to go first? Oh, Luke has a question. Well, let's start with you, Luke. I have a question, a, a development question. So uh, I'm pretty sure I can find tutorials online on how to build a block. But the part that I'm confused about as a developer, the part that maybe is the most scary for me, is all of this business about NPM and having to use the command line and what's Webpack and things like that. And that's not something I'm used to. Could you tell me how do I get started with that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, JavaScript tooling can be pretty complex nowadays. Um, so it's a good question. Um, you don't need to use Webpack or anything uh, to build a block in Gutenberg. Um, the API that we expose is all kind of ECMAScript 5 compatible, so just regular old JavaScript that you can run in the browser as is. Um, and just using, and, and on, on the handbook, the uh, wordpress.org slash gutenberg slash handbook, we have snippets in both ECMAScript 5, which is stuff you can just kind of copy and paste into the browser straight away. You don't need to have any tooling set up at all. Um, and that will work fine, and that's completely supported. Um, you know, we, many JavaScript developers prefer to use, uh, you know, newer JavaScript features, in particular because Gutenberg uses React. Um, many people prefer to define their components using JSX, which is the kind of HTML-looking syntax for JavaScript. And you can opt into that. That's when you would have to set up Webpack and something like that to, to compile that fancy new syntax into something that the browser can understand. But it's not necessary. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we take one from the floor, and then we'll come back to your question, Kath. Uh, yes, uh, when, when you say use JavaScript, um, I spoke to a very experienced developer and he says no one uses JavaScript. <laughs> right. That's uh, yesterday's news. You need at least a solid IDE to actually do something with that. How does it integrate with any extra IDEs? Because cutting JavaScript may not necessarily work very well for, for a lot of people. Yeah, of course, if you're building a, you know, you would define your block probably in a plugin that you're building, and most of us who are writing plugins would use an IDE, you know, Visual Studio Code or PHP Storm, something like that. Most of us would use something like that to build our plugin, and um, I can't name an IDE that doesn't have good JavaScript tooling in it. Um, so it should work very seamlessly. So is the question then, you don't need different JavaScript tooling for Gutenberg than you would for any other JavaScript development that you were doing? Exactly. Okay. Let us. Is anyone here a front-end uh, developer, theme developer? 
Okay, so this question is for all of these people. You people. <laughs> um, how much more styling needs to be added into their themes to accommodate for all the blocks and the spacing and the, the, um, the new components that are actually in the editor? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so Gutenberg defines a small amount of CSS for all of the blocks that are included in it. Um, and as a theme developer, you could introduce more CSS than what comes built in to uh, tailor the blocks for your specific needs. Maybe you want it to match the appearance of your website, or maybe you want to customize the block styling somehow. Yeah, the, the styling you introduce in your theme would add on to the, the styling that comes with Gutenberg. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think that would be an interesting exercise for someone to do, to kind of catalogue the blogs that are there to be able to say, if you are a theme developer, you might want to look at tailoring what you're in store Gutenberg, have a play with it, and then have a look at the kind of blogs that you might want to customise for your own. Hi, I have a couple of um, questions from Twitter, actually. Um, so the first one um, is um, a reference to yesterday's keynote. Um, Advanced Custom Fields says, Super impressed with the demo, so congrats, Luke. Um, the reusable shared blocks feature is a great idea, um, but only works with a single paragraph block. What about images and text? Do you actually would <laughs> uh, Yeah, shared, shared blocks, um, they work for any single block. So if you have an image block, you can convert it into a shared block and use it throughout your website, throughout posts and pages in Gutenberg. Um, or a paragraph block, any block, a shared block, um, any block can be made into a shared block. Is that the kind of I answer? I think so, yeah. I think <laughs> that's, that's how I understand it as well, yeah. yeah. Um, and the second question I have is from Roby Lawrence. Can you create Gutenberg templates or layouts um, so the post design is always consistent without recreating the layout on each one? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, we have a feature called templates. Um, when you're defining your custom post type, you can specify the kind of initial set of blocks that will appear in that post. You can even lock it down so that the user can't add any more blocks. You can even lock it down further so that the user can't rearrange the blocks, which is kind of nice. You can build a custom post type that you know, really matches the kind of design for your site. Does that happen in the, does that happen in the interface that you see at the, in you know, the editor, or is that something that has to happen in the code? That's something that you specify in the code, yes. I know it's not a, a really a complete uh, solution to replace things like ACF, uh, but if you are able to write that code and you're able to develop your own custom blocks, then templates and custom blocks combined would go a very long way towards solving that ACF problem actually in, in a much more user-friendly way. So that's starting to sound like Gutenberg becoming more of a page builder than just a content editor? Uh, is it no. there yet? Is it that? Uh, so page builders, I'm sure, is a topic we'll get onto. I'll yeah. say, say one more thing about this ACF topic and then answer what you're suggesting. Um, so where I think ACF may go in the future, uh, or a plugin could replace it doing a similar thing, ACF, all it does is it provides you with a user interface for adding custom meta, right? Well, we could do that with code if we wanted and create custom meta options for a post, or we can use ACF, which is a nice user interface that stops you from writing the, writing the code. So there's no reason why another plugin couldn't come along and help you define custom post types with preset block templates, which is, you know, basically what ACF does in a different context. Um, on the topic of page builders, I, I think there's a lot of confusion because I don't think, I don't define Gutenberg as a page builder. I define it as a content builder because when you, you know, start to pick up page builders and things like this, a lot of the time 
it goes far beyond just the content of that page. Sometimes you can do things like, oh, I want my header on the right-hand side, my logo, and then put the navigation at this point and three widgets in the footer and things like that. Gutenberg doesn't do anything in terms of the layout of your website, right? It just handles the content of your blog posts and your pages, you know, and your posts, post types. Uh, so there's a bit of a difference there. Yep. Um, on that, on that thing that you guys are talking about just now, so um, even if you code um, from the code, you have all these uh, blocks in Gutenberg um, in the content. Uh, in order to replace it uh, uh, with the um, ACF Pro, how are you going to do database query on that field specifically? Because they're going to be all sitting in the content instead of sitting in different fields. So when you're building a custom block uh, in Gutenberg, you can um, specify that the content from that block is sourced from post meta um, rather than from the post content. OK, so you pretty much create a new field from a code perspective, and then you put whatever content in that block into that field. Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, if you're defining like a, an author bio block or something, uh, you know, that might have two attributes. It might be like name and description. Yep. And you could source name. You can specify in the kind of schema for that block. You can be like, this is the name field, and it comes okay. from meta. This is the description field, and it comes from meta or from content, wherever. Sorry, that way. Yeah. With the with with the um, the editor, I guess like I come from an ACF kind of background as well. And, like my idea is to not allow people to change things like colors and that type of thing just for the for no reason. Um, like, is it easy to turn off some of the features of the blocks, like some of the say colors or you know, yeah yeah sizes um, and things like that? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different ways to extend Gutenberg um, colors. Specifically, I think we have like a an array of like allowed colors or something that we source from that you could um, specify. But in general, yeah, any of the standard. Um, I mean, there's many different ways to customize. Like we could we could, for example, just disable a particular block type, or if we want to just kind of lock that block type down a little bit, we could maybe remove one of one or two features from it. Um, there's like hooks and filters in Gutenberg to, to do some of that customization. And if that's not flexible, you know, these blocks are open source, you could create a new one that's kind of based on one of the existing blocks. Just to, to you touched on something briefly there, which I think maybe needs to be reset because it's huge, especially if you are a theme designer uh, or you work at an agency. How many of you have had that experience where you build a beautiful looking theme, hand it over to the client, and two days later, it's the most ugly thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, not just me. All the time. So, <laughs> one, of the, one of my favorite features in Gutenberg, I don't know if you would have noticed during the demo yesterday, but you know, the, there's a sidebar, and it's got the block options there. And for some blocks, you can do things like specify a background color, or specify the text color. Well, two interesting things with these color palettes. You can choose, as the theme author, which colors are, it's possible to choose from and lock it down. So maybe you can choose one of just three different colors in, and not the color picker where they choose fluoro pink. Um, and the other cool thing with this is that, so, so maybe you've got five colors that you use in your theme. You can just set those for the text and the background. But the other really cool feature is that, suppose I set my background to white and my text color to pale yellow, right? <laughs> Gutenberg will give me a notification, uh, give you know your users a notification that says, this is gonna be really hard to read. You should consider changing the, the color of the text or the contrast. background yeah. because it's not enough contrast. So, yeah. That's one more question. Um, I read uh, online that uh, this uh, this is going to be default feature in WordPress in uh, with WordPress 5.0. Um, I have a concern with it. Um, we have plenty of websites online, 
And once it's going to be default feature, we use some other plugins like Visual Composer and various others in different websites. So once this gets launched and we update our WordPress, is it going to affect the current website? Or is there any option that we can use either this one or other content editor if there is a problem? Yeah, so I actually asked the same question from the team that are developing and designing Gutenberg and working on it at the moment. And um, it was one of my fears as well. So firstly, the initial release of Gutenberg, and correct me if I'm wrong, Luke, but um, is going to uh, give you an option to actually try it. Is that correct? That, that's the next release of that, WordPress. Oh, okay, yep. so the next release of WordPress. Yep. And then when Gutenberg drops into core, um, it is going to give you an option to disable it or to replace it with the classic editor or to be able to download the classic editor plugin to override the Gutenberg. So you will have some options there. Is that correct? Does that answer your question? I think, I think my, I was going to add something, if I may. Sure. I think one of the, the recommendations is, if, is the plugin is available now to download now. And so my recommendation is if you are fearful about what's going to happen in the future, download it and try it on a staging server or on a local development environment to see what kind of effect it's going to have. And then you can, can plan ahead for that just to make sure that um, it doesn't all go to custard when, when it does become core. Okay, so you use Visual Composer, right? Oh, so right now in Visual Composer, isn't there an option when you go to create a page with the Visual Composer tooling to just create that page with the normal editor instead? Yeah, we don't want to do that. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is once Gutenberg lands, that same option will still exist. You'll open up your Visual Composer, be able to compose a web page just the same way as you do now. And then if you want, switch to Gutenberg. You, you can choose. It's the same with uh, Beaver Builder. It's the same with Divi. You can choose whether you want to use their interface or the built-in editor. And so right now, it's you choose the, the you know, classic, what we're calling the classic editor or the page builder. And in the future, you'll choose between Gutenberg and the page builder. OK. Um is, is that that uh, default content editor, if even like uh, if we download this plugin and install on the website, on, on staging server, uh, is that other plugin also available so that we can try both, like installing this one and then if it doesn't go well, then we install the other one? You mean the classic, is the classic editor yeah. plugin yeah. available now? Yeah, the classic editor plugin is available now. If you install it mm -hmm. then, uh, and activate it, then when WordPress updates, mm -hmm. Uh, then you won't get Gutenberg. Okay. But okay. Mm -hmm. don't do that. <laughs> and here's why. I'll tell you why. Why? It's because Gutenberg is more than just a new editor. All right? The block paradigm that Gutenberg uses is going to make its way into every part of WordPress. Uh, in the future, WordPress won't have widgets. Maybe they'll still be called widgets. But they'll be completely under the hood, at least translated into blocks, content blocks. Right? In the future, when we go into the customizer, we'll see our content blocks on the front end of our website and maybe update them from within the customizer. So you can imagine all of these different ways where content blocks as a paradigm are going to make their way into all different aspects of WordPress. So if you want to install the classic editor, that is definitely a, an option available to you, but you'll be left behind. Luke has a question. Uh, no, I have a question Dan. for Luke. <laughs> That's Luke there. Uh, there. Yeah, but any, the, the previous question is actually, to me, very relevant because it's a bit of a sample of what I hear from a lot of people in the community. So I know Luke has a, a great vision for where Gutenberg is going to take us, and if you'd like to share it, I'd, I'd love to hear it again. But on the flip side of that, we also have a lot of people that I suppose in essence, are a bit scared of change. And is this going to break my site? What do I have to do to get on board? What is this going to mean for my business, for my blog, for my... And, and you've got these two total opposites, uh, opposite views of Gutenberg. And that puts us as engineers and developers in a very tricky spot because now who do you cater for? 
if you take on any project right now, it's very hard to know, do I go all in Gutenberg because soon WordPress is just going to be Gutenberg, or do I need to cater for everybody that's still using the, the classic editor? So I suppose from the panel, I'd like you guys maybe to, to take out your crystal ball and have a look and, and think, what's the adoption for Gutenberg going to be once it hits core? Is everybody just going to see, this is great, let's just get on board, and within a month, everybody's just Gutenberg? Or is there going to be this long trail of people just kind of trickling in? And what does that mean for us as engineers and developers? Let's all have a shot at this, eh? Hey? <laughs> and then we can compare later on. My prediction is that we'll hear a lot of very vocal dissent in the first three days after 5.0 comes out. Within a month, there'll be less than 1%, less than half a percent of websites that don't run Gutenberg. Yeah, I mean, already I've noticed in the last year, I mean, since WordCamp US, um, the attitude in the community has shifted somewhat from that of like a fear of the unknown to like a positive attitude, like how, how do we make this happen? What can we do to help? Um, I hope, <laughs> I hope it's an instant success. Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> that would be my hope. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to approach this from the, um, the small business user and the, and my clients. So the users of the websites that we create. And also I'm, I, I do a lot of WordPress tutoring one-on-one -on -one, and, um, for the last few weeks, at least, I've been turning on Gutenberg. And so the first instance of these people seeing WordPress editor is actually these blocks. And it's surprising me, actually, how quickly people are embracing that and going, oh, I thought it wasn't going to be like that. I didn't know we were able to do this. So there's a sense of kind of a little bit of excitement when people see it because I like it's quite refreshing and when you compare it to things that have been around for a while like Squarespace where you uh, we you've got these drag and drop kind of blocks and still limited but like within content and it's just quite natural and I think people are going to be quite pleasantly surprised that WordPress has kind of brought it in um, and making it native I don't know if that is future but I know that it is present and I think that is it, it's exciting not scary I would like to add something too, yeah. may I? <laughs> so I approach this question from the other end of the market, which is the large scale enterprise. And we as an agency have embraced Gutenberg very, very early on. And there is pain. There has been pain for us in, in some cases because we look at some of the things that we want to build. It takes longer than we thought it was going to because there's a huge learning curve. And even for our guys who are very experienced PHP developers in a lot of cases, having to embrace this new paradigm of developing a lot more closely in React and in JavaScript. On the other side of that are the clients who are, we're putting them in a place where we're almost free, not so much future proofing them, but future preparing them to make sure that when things do change, the stuff that we're building now, we're not going to have to go through the technical debt of then converting them into a place where they're actually using the classic editor sort of going forward. But, we, but it, it has come with some pain and some challenges, and, um, but I think we're all on this place at the moment where we're prepared to embrace that um, for, the, for the good of the community and for our clients going forward. The thing that I wanted to add to the conversation in, on this particular topic is that I love WordPress as much as the next guy, right? But the current editor is objectively bad. Yeah. It just is bad. It's old and it's clunky and it hasn't been updated in years. And so if you're going to tell me that you don't like Gutenberg, fine. But show me what's the alternative to the current editor because you know, we, need, we need it to be updated. We can't just love it because that's the way it's always been. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And on that note, I think Matt Mullenweg said something that I agree with, which is like it would be very profitable and easy you know, in the short term to do nothing. But if we want to build a WordPress for the next 15 years, um, you know, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> I think the, um, the beauty of WordPress in general and the way that they have um, added many changes over the last few years that we actually really, or they, you, 
<laughs> the Automac team and the team behind WordPress really respect the users that have been using it for a while. They respect the different um, different capacities that people use it, and uh, that you know they understand that not everyone is looking at their WordPress website every day. So they do tend to make things backwards compatible, and I think that they've done a really good job of giving us options with Gutenberg and getting, giving us an opportunity to test it and to disable it if we need to in order to get our sites ready. And I think that that's um, kudos to the team. They haven't just kind of, you know, slammed it down and said good luck. There's been a lot of respect and um, care taken to, mo to make sure that pe too many people aren't affected by it. Who's next? Ricky? Hi, guys. I uh, just want a little developer question. Uh, back to what you said at the beginning, what do you need to create a block? You said JavaScript, but that's a great answer. You didn't say React. So my question is um, about good com compatibility with other framework, JavaScript frameworks. If it's possible to create blocks in other frameworks, and um, <clears throat> if it is possible, uh, like I heard as humor, um, would you, assuming that organization have different skill set, you know, you, you can have a, a team in Vue.js or whatever, uh, uh, Angular or stuff, would you actually even try, or would you just like build a new team in React uh, or hire React person? I mean, yeah. how flexible are the APIs? That's that's my question. Y yeah, we've, we've tried to build the APIs to be as React independent as possible. I think I've even seen a, um, a, uh, a gist somewhere, or maybe even a pull request, I forget where I saw it, where someone had built like an interoperability layer between Vue and what we expose. Um, so it's definitely something you could look into doing. I don't really know how to answer what I think you're asking, which is like, is it worth retraining uh, your team to use React. Um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. W where we can, we have tried to make it as framework independent as possible. You've seen any mm, Vue.js, Angular implementation of blocks out there, or is none? Find me later. I'm pretty sure I've seen a Vue implementation of a block. So we've got maybe eight or nine minutes to go. So, um, just giving you that heads up, basically. We have eight minutes to go. So if you are desperate and busting, and busting for a question, then um, get it up, get your hand up. Uh, the, the question of the get going about the structure of uh, Gutenberg, the, there is a word that it's not only JavaScript, but also PHP. Hence, when you start testing, you've got to have a specific hybrid environment to do that. Is that correct? Could you could you just put more light on that? What is that actually mix of JavaScript and PHP? To build, for example, a block? Um, yeah, so if you're building, it depends on the block you're building. If you're building a um, kind of a user-facing, like an entirely user-facing block, then I think you would only need JavaScript. Uh, where you would need PHP to enter the mix is if you're uh, building a what we call a dynamic block, which is, for example, the latest posts block that uh, Luke demonstrated yesterday. That's a dynamic block because when you view it on the front end, the content uh, you know is generated on the fly, and that's done with PHP. Does that kind of help? One is the, yeah, the, in terms of framework, one is entirely browser-based, JavaScript, and the, and the PHP goes into a backend, as you're saying, doing some operations. So you need actually some setup for local uh, environment, or, or what's, the, what's the advice on that? Yeah, you, um, you, if, if you're building a block, you would be doing that in a plugin, and your plugin would contain both JavaScript and PHP code in that case. Um, yeah. Did you have something? Um, I th I think I would look at WordPress.tv. Oh, sorry, is it WordPress.tv? Yeah. And there are lots of good talks there on uh, setting up your IDE. So uh, there was a talk just yesterday about setting it up with Xdebug, using Xdebug for your PHP, and then you know there are different things that you can use as well for debugging JavaScript in the browser. So 
in terms of your IDE setup and all of that sort of thing, I'd just refer you to some of the previous talks at WordCamps. Question over here. Sorry, yeah. just we also um, have seen in the community a tool called Create Guten Block, which might be useful too as like a boilerplate for getting started. Awesome. Yeah, hi. Um, so during the keynote yesterday, Luke, you were discussing um, some social media orientated content blocks for Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, etc. Um, I was wondering how they were implemented regarding whether the content was brought in directly through the browser or if it was possible to cache, cache some of that content PHP or server side um, and what we can do to, to make those content blocks load quickly if the service on the other end wasn't, wasn't serving fast. Uh, interestingly, that is not a new feature. You can do that in the current WordPress editor. Uh, only there's no button for it. You just have to know that you can paste a link. If you were to paste in that same Reddit link into the current editor and hit enter, it would actually embed that <laughs> in, a, in a very similar way. It uses technology called OEmbed, and I don't believe there's any caching layer, but correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think it happens on the fly in the browser. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, those blocks are implemented by the front end hitting the OEmbed endpoint. If you wanted to implement caching on the server, you could maybe look at um, customizing that block to have a s uh, to make it into a dynamic block. Um, because it's important to note that a block doesn't necessarily have to be static or dynamic. You can have a hybrid. You can have the um, the static content that renders, uh, you know, everywhere, like in an email client or an RSS reader or something like that, and then also define in PHP a render callback, um, which will replace that block with some dynamic content on the, the main front end of your website. I would look at doing that if that's a use case that you have. <laughs> Hi, I've really enjoyed the Gutenberg experience in developing websites, but my question is around this. One around this, uh, what usability tests have been undertaken in assessing high performance bloggers workflow and performance in writing content? Lots, actually. Uh, I've sort of been involved uh, watching the Gutenberg development process from the designer perspective. And there's been some a bit of design led uh, work done on the customizer in the past, but to me, Gutenberg is really the first major WordPress component to be created uh, with designers sort of implementing the first idea of how it should work and then the developers coming in around that. So to me, that's a really exciting development. And I've been a part of and, and seen a lot of user tests taking place. Actually, a lot happened in Brisbane, uh, surprisingly, and all around the world. Uh, at word camps like this one, and uh, I've seen them at, at word camp in Europe and in the US, uh, and basically um, there's, there's been a lot of user testing. And there, there was published on um, Anna Harrison's blog the user test that walkthrough that, that she got people to do. Um, and that, I think, was used as a, a bit of a template around the world. So. Yeah, it, it's exciting because this is really the first time that's been done in WordPress and, and I hope we see more of it in the future. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So what would you um, suggest as the perfect transition to get used to Gutenberg for, the, for a website? Is it to install the plugin and be proactive, I guess? And if so, what will be the difference between the Gutenberg as a plugin and once it's in, in core, is, will there be any difference? There'll be less bugs in core. <laughs> so is but it ready to go live now as a plugin on a live site? Uh, I use it in production. Uh, <coughs> so uh, I don't know. I, I think, I it think it, it's, it's a good time now. We're using it in production as well. We've been bitten a couple of times when things have changed. Um, but now that there's code freeze um, or feature freeze, I feel like that's going to happen less and less. So um, my advice is, install it um, 
there's still people that would say install it locally and try it out before you commit, but I install it and use it and, and give people feedback. Give the, there's plenty of opportunity to be able to give feedback to the team to be able to help make it better. Just on that, Dee, I'll ask you since you guys are using it in production now, um, what's going to be the best way to flick over from being, using the plugin to when it drops into core, what's the kind of process? Do we turn the plugin off or will it automatically turn the plug on off for us? I don't know. The I, I have the that answer question. on that one. Um, May, if thank you, you install the plugin version of Gutenberg now, when Gutenberg makes its way into core in 5.0, the plugin version will be automatically deactivated, Sweet. so it will be completely seamless. That's awesome. Thank you. Brilliant. That's a good, that's a good place to end it. <laughs> um, and uh, we're, we're around. If you guys have any other questions you want to ask us directly, we're more than happy to do that. Thank you. Thanks to our team. Of